Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. Hi, in this Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to go through the early visual process in the brain. Vision is about constructing an internal model of the visual world, not just faithfully reproducing the information on the back of the eyes. So the brain is creating um, a model that goes way beyond the kind of information that we uh, get in. And this is really exemplified by visual illusions, which are really created by the brain rather than being something that is out there in the real world or existing on the eyes. So for instance, if we look at the Kinesa illusion, the brain creates the idea of an illusory white triangle that isn't really there. Or if we look at the Necker cube, we interpret this as a 3D image that's ambiguous. We can um, alternate uh, whether the front or the back is uh, near or far. But here, what's happening is that all the eye is doing is receiving information about light and dark. And what the brain is doing is that it's segmenting that light and dark into edges and surfaces and so on. So it's going way beyond the basic information that's being given in order to figure out what this is, uh, whether it's 3D or 2D, given that all images on the back of the eye are basically 2D. So I'm not going to be talking about the eye. I'm going to be talking about the brain and the variety of mechanisms involved in this. But I'm not going to be talking about all of those mechanisms. I'm going to be talking about the mechanisms and the, the routes from the eye to the brain, and then a particular central hub in the brain called the primary visual cortex. It's primary because it's the first cortical area to receive information uh, from the eyes, although it does so indirectly via other uh, synaptic routes. From the primary visual cortex, it branches out to other specialized regions that are uh, involved, for instance, in color, shape, and motion. And from this, we go on to construct a higher order knowledge of the world, such as recognizing faces and objects, or being able to act on objects. And we'll cover that in uh, the later on in the series. So first of all, let's consider the roots from the, um, the eye to the brain. So the retina itself contains a, a wide variety of different cells and synapses. So early computation is done at the level of the eye. From the eye to the brain, there's a whole set of different roots. There isn't just one root. Each of these roots serves somewhat different purposes and have been added on at different stages of evolution. So, for instance, birds don't have the same kind of cortical brain regions that, that humans have, but they have other roots and other pathways. But um, humans have also retained some of these. So to give you a flavour for some of this, uh, one route from the eye goes uh, into a subcortical region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this is involved for setting the biological clock, for telling you whether it's light or day. But this brain region has nothing to do in uh, telling whether an object is, is a house or a face or a cup. That would be done by uh, uh, other regions. Similarly, there are other circuits that are involved, for instance, in um, detecting sudden changes in uh, brightness or sound that will uh, alert the head or the eyes to look away uh, to, to flashes and bangs. Uh, for instance, the super superior colliculus is in the midbrain. And again, this is an evolutionary ancient part uh, of the visual brain uh, that serves particular purposes, but again, is not involved in um, higher order recognition uh, or detailed visual processes. And a lot of these evolutionary ancient roots are also uh, somewhat unconscious in their, their processes in the, the sense that they don't give rise to our uh, conscious uh, awareness of uh, seeing. So if we damage uh, cortical areas of the brain, these other regions of the brain will still be functioning. The person will say, I cannot see. They will say that they're blind, but in fact, they are able to, for instance, tell light from dark or to be able to orient to uh, a sudden flash. So the main route from the eye to the brain that's involved in high level visual processing and also our conscious visual experiences is called the, um, the geniculostriate pathway. 
So it goes from the eye to a, a region near the a thalamus called the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus. And from the lateral geniculate nucleus, it then goes uh, to what's called the primary visual cortex or the striate cortex. Uh, and this route uh, contains many more neurons uh, than the other visual routes. So it's a lot uh, uh, more vivid in, in terms of more, more detailed in terms of the information that is carried in this particular pathway. As information is transferred from the eyes to the, uh, the cortex, uh, more detailed information uh, is, is carried forward. By the time that we get to the, uh, the visual cortex uh, in uh, V1, the striate cortex, we're able to detect, for instance, uh, uh, particular edges uh, um, and uh, certain wavelengths. So this is important for detecting colors uh, and also sudden changes. What we find is that uh, V1 has a particular organization that is called uh, retinocentric. And basically this is, uh, to some extent, reproducing the spatial layout that exists on the retina. So the image on the retina uh, will be upside down with respect to the, um, the world. And this is also projected forwards to the back of the brain. But remember, there is no light in the back of the brain. All there is is the firing of neurons. Also, the left-right orientation is also preserved, such that the left hemisphere processes what's called the right visual field, and the, uh, the right uh, hemisphere, the right V1, processes the left visual field. But note that the visual field isn't exactly the same as the left eye and the right eye. So my left eye, for instance, can process information for both the left and the right part of space. And you can prove this to yourself by closing one eye and you should be able to see both sides of space. So the brain is processing the sides of space rather than information from the two eyes. And in fact, a V1 pulls together information uh, from the two eyes. Whereas earlier stages, um, for instance, in the lateral geniculate nucleus, the information from the eyes is still separate. So V1 is one of the early stages of binocular vision or depth processing. So V1 has this spatial or what's called retinotopic or retinocentric map. What this also means is that if you damage a part of your primary visual cortex, then this will mean that you're blind for certain regions of space, but not the entire region of space. So for instance, if I have brain damage in uh, my left visual cortex, then I will be uh, blind for the right side of space, but I would still be able to see the left side of space. What this feels like is not necessarily that you have a, a black area in your visual field, it's just that vision doesn't exist. In the same way as I move to the edges of my visual field, it doesn't become black, it just ceases to exist visually. Uh, and this is what it would be like to be uh, cortically blind. You have a reduced uh, visual field. But as I've said before, other pathways in the brain might still be responding to, uh, for instance, flashes of light in that um, blind visual field. And this is a phenomenon called blindsight. So the primary visual cortex is important for our conscious aspects of vision. So if you damage your V1, you will say, I cannot see stuff on this side of space. It appears to be blind. But actually other parts of the brain will still be able to process information because the roots found out and are still intact. Uh, so in this case, you've got the paradoxical situation of feeling that you're blind for one side of space, but still being able to detect uh, movement or flashes or other kinds of simple light stimulation. The responsive properties of neurons in primary visual cortex were elucidated by pioneering studies done by um, uh, Hubel and Weasel. They recorded from single cells uh, and looked at the patterns of electrical firing in these cells when patterns of light were presented to the animal. Whereas neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus respond to uh, small patches of light, um, uh, neurons in primary visual cortex would respond to more complex uh, patterns of light and dark. So the region of space that a neuron responds to is called its receptive field. And throughout the brain, some neurons have large or small receptive fields. They differ in size. They would also differ in shape and other kinds of properties. 
So whereas um, neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus have small receptive fields that respond uh, to, for instance, single points of light and dark, in the primary visual cortex, you find neurons that respond not only to single points of light, but will respond to uh, several points of light, for instance, ranged in a row in a particular orientation. And these were called simple cells. They respond to uh, several points of light, as well as a length of light, down a particular orientation. And neurons in V1 might be tuned to particular orientations. So some will respond to plus 10 degrees, others to 45 degrees, others to 190 degrees, and so on. So they have these particular tuning properties to orientations. What was also found is some neurons are sensitive not only to points of light, but only respond when light is um, uh, of a particular length. And these are called complex or hypercomplex cells. So complex cells res respond to, um, uh, to to lines of light and dark, and hypercomplex cells respond to lines of light and dark of a particular length. So they're length-specific cells. So the idea here is that we've got this top-down flow of information from simple point-like uh, representations to edges, and then from edges to surfaces to objects. So this is a hierarchical view of vision processing. It's also a bottom to top, up, top uh, view of visual processing, going from simple to more complex. But of course, going from complex to simple would also happen. So neurons in V1 would also respond according to whether a line is representing what's called the figure, so the foreground or the background. So neurons respond more when they are the figure in the foreground than they are the background. But neurons in V1 don't know what is figure and what is foreground because this is too early in the visual process. So how can they respond in this way? Well, they have to respond in this way because that information is not coming from the eyes. It's coming from the brain, from higher order regions of the brain that have already done the work of segmenting the visual scene into foreground and background. And it's passing the information back down into areas uh, such as V1.